Normally at this time of year, I'd be in the Red Sea. But although the weather here in England is, is just like the Red Sea, um, obviously we're not there this year. But it reminded me of those great times and I thought I'd use it as an opportunity to try and do a web talk, um, web webinar as they're known, um, on underwater photography. And I thought I'd choose a subject that's not too technical, that's nice and broad in its application. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, fish photography. The Red Sea trips, oh, that's blocking me out, are a big part of, of my summers down the earth. I counted up the other week and I've done, I think, close to 35 Red Sea liverboard trips and, and 25 of those have been running underwater photography workshops. There's photos of 22 of them there on the screen with me. I'll just slide those away because it's causing me to lean over. And on a huge number of those, I've given a version of this talk, which has evolved a great deal down the years. Um, and the subject of the talk is fish photography. Now, I have to say that the Red Sea trips, my Red Sea workshops, tend not to be that much about fish photography. The summer workshops, we go there very much for the big school encounters. There's lots and lots of schools gathering at this time of year. But we also really enjoy our, our rec photography in particular. Um, the rec photography in the Red Sea is fantastic. Um, and those are kind of the two main themes of the, the workshop. We also do a little bit on reef scenery photography. Red Sea scenery is absolutely fantastic. And um, we also talk a little about shooting some of the bigger animals that we can encounter at different times of the, of the year there. Fish in the Red Sea, they're always there. And this is a good talk that I tend to keep in the back pocket for the tail end of the week when everyone is sort of looking for some fresh inspiration. And it's a nice non-technical talk. Um, rec photography and schooling fish photography involves quite a lot of technique. This talk is a little bit more just about what to think about while you're shooting. I like um, this. These I like to always give these talks something of a historical perspective. I'm a big fan of the history of underwater photography, and I thought I'd I'd dig out something on fish photography today. This is from Mastering Underwater Photography by by Carl Rosler from the the 70s um, book. Actually, this is what my publishers wanted to call my book actually, but um, having had with since I own this book, I didn't want to repeat the name. And I like that Carl calls um, the title on fish photography. Um, fish portraiture, the ultimate skill, um, which I think really, you know, gives us some impact on the level of the challenge. So I'm going to do this talk in two parts. Um, they're both about 15, 20 minutes long. My deadline is having to go and pick up Isa from nursery in about an hour's time. I will stop in the middle and try using the technology to answer any questions that you type up on, on Facebook. So feel free if I miss, um, if I don't explain something correctly to, to let me know. And I'll go through that. Right, so let me get this slideshow up um, and we'll crack straight on into it. Right, that should be my slideshow. And, oh, wait a sec, it's a little bit away from the beginning. There we go. And now I'm just going to try and make myself reappear, if I can, on screen. And there we go. So you can see me as well. So... As I said, it's trying to be not too technical a talk, trying to make you think a little bit differently. I think that's a good subject for a, a live web broadcast. So for me, fish photography as underwater photographers, and most of you watching this, this I think we, we're sort of a little bit of an enclosed gr closed group. We can be honest. We love fish, but a lot of people out there in the general public, they're not so keen on, on fish as wildlife. For them, they're grey, brown, silvery, scaly, slimy things that lack charisma. And I think if we want our pictures to appeal, not just to people who love fish already, but to the wider public, we really want to try and elevate fish beyond being these scaly, slimy things into something that people want to look at. Now, we're very fortunate that actually fish come in a whole diversity of forms. There's quite bizarre looking creatures. There's character filled individuals. There's incredibly colourful species of fish out there. And there's some really impressive aggregations of fish. So we're, we're well placed to be able to take powerful pictures. I do think one of the mistakes we make as underwater photographers quite a bit is um, that we do tend to focus our attention again and again on the same types of fish, often the easiest ones to shoot. And I think one great way to make our work stand out from other people's is to take on some of the less charismatic species. Or when we are photographing the species that we photograph a lot, then I think then we should try and take our photography to another level. So I tend to give this talk on the Red Sea workshop. So just there's a few slides in the talk. This is the talk from last year's workshop. Is that um, 
fresh um is that fish i think the message is coming up on screen which i don't really want to write on facebook but <laughs> feel free to post away um so the the message on the, on the red sea is the red sea is a great place for fish photography first of all there's loads of fish there but there's two other reasons that make a big difference first of all the water is clear that means we can shoot fish a lot of the time with longer lenses i mean this is a fish i shot and this slightly longer camera to subject distance can really allow us to to sort of get stronger portraits of our subjects but the other reason why the Red Sea is so good for fish photography is that lots of divers go diving there. So the fish are used to people. And for me, the best places to photograph fish are on dive sites that see lots of divers. You don't need to be on a challenging dive to shoot fish. It generally makes it harder. And if you go to a dive site that sees lots of divers, particularly trainee divers, and you dive well, you'll be amazed how friendly and cooperative the fish are. And that can really allow us to get these frame filling and powerful images. This picture here was taken at, at Rassam Sid, which is one of the dive sites just in Sharm El Sheikh that sees loads and loads of divers and snorkelers every day. And the fish there are that much more approachable than on a much more remote reef. It's also a very beautiful reef, I have to say. I also like the fact that the Red Sea, although it's got lots of familiar species, has also got lots of special species. So it gives you the chance to get those unusual pictures. This is a, um, a fish that we call the unicorn goby. We've been photographing this species for quite a few years now. But actually, it only got its Latin name last year. So it's pretty cool that we, we got some, some surprising species in there as well. OK, so I think what the theme of the first part of this talk is, is to encourage you to go beyond just getting standard shots, whether that's with your subject or whether that's with your background. And I think a good sort of case study for this are anemone fish. In the Red Sea, we have only, only one species. It's the, the one on the, the right there, um, just, just down below me. Um, um, which is the, the two-banded anemone fish. But anemone fish are a great subject as for fish photographers because our public, anyone who's looking at them, knows this species. You know, I, I would say, you know, 90% of the, the, the people who are likely to ever see your photos will have heard of anemone fish and be able to recognise them. And as an underwater photographer, that's quite a liberation because most of the time we're often having to explain our subjects to our, our audience. And if we're too creative, too wacky, too interpretive with our photography, our pictures won't necessarily appeal to them. But I think an enemy fish is somewhere we can push the boundaries away. We can tell the classic story of the anemone fish's relationship with the anemone in macro or wide angle, or we can challenge the audience by finding different angles, a top-down view, or even photographing an anemone fish without any view of the anemone at all. We can try different techniques. This is, is a wide angle shot. And or we can try unusual creative techniques, such as this one is here, using a, an unusual lens, an old-fashioned lens, to create interesting bokeh or to create really unusual views of these subjects. And I think the, the reason I wanted to start off by showing you these pictures was to make that point that when we have got a familiar subject, we can really push our photography into new areas to create interesting images. But there's no one way to do that. We get those strong shots by actually pushing our photography in lots of different directions. And, and of course, we can tell interesting stories by capturing behavior too. One thing that you tend not to see photos of with an enemy fish, and this is a little bit of, of marine biology stuff for you, is that you very rarely see pictures of an enemy fish actually laying eggs. The previous shot shows them laying eggs. But the reason I think that we don't see an enemy fish photos of, of laying eggs very much is an enemy fish are quite timid when they lay eggs. We're very used to seeing damselfish and things like that laying eggs, and damselfish are very confident, and they just carry on with the behavior when we go in to shoot them. But anemone fish, they, they have to leave the protection of their anemone and swim out onto the rocks nearby to lay eggs. And so they're quite nervous about it. And we very often see anemone fish guarding eggs, but we don't see them laying eggs. And I think that's because when photographers see an anemone fish with eggs, they'll go in close to take photos of the eggs. And usually the anemone fish then retreat back into the anemone and stop laying. So what I've learned as a way to get photos of anemone fish laying eggs is when you spot an enemy fish with new eggs and new eggs of an enemy fish tend to be very colorful as they get older and older they look more and more silvery like these damselfish legs on the on the right of the screen do um, but when i see an enemy fish with colorful eggs i'll back away i'll stay a, a meter a meter and a half away from the enemy and watch for a couple of minutes to see if that behavior starts to come back again if we see if we start to get good egg laying going on and if you get that good egg laying then then you can start getting these shots. But both of these shots are taken with quite long lenses. I'm sitting back with a 100mm lens. I'm not really pushing to really fill the frame with the subjects. 
Um, because I think an enemy fish, generally, if you go all the way in, you'll often disrupt this behavior and you won't be able to get the shots. The enemy fish will carry on once you've left, um, but if you can get them behaving. So the key thing for me, if I ever see an enemy fish with new eggs, it means colorful eggs, is to give them a bit of distance, a bit of space, and see if the behavior comes on. Anyway, back to fish photography. So I said at the beginning of the talk um, that as underwater photographers, we love fish, but a lot of our audience feel that they're slimy, scaly, boring things. So if we want them to connect with our subject, we want them to connect with our subject, not as fish, but as individuals. And we do that by finding ways to emphasize as much character as we can in the subject. If we can create pictures of fish, that the reaction from the audience is, oh, that looks cute, that looks surprised, that looks angry. That means that they're seeing it not just as a fish anymore, but as an individual with some personality coming through. And that can really help them connect with the picture and make our fish picture that much more powerful, much more resonant. Creating this connection starts with one thing, and that's the eyes of the subject. And making that effort to get down to the eye level of your subjects is really, really critical to get that character coming through. And there's no big skill in this. It's just about often the hard work of contorting your body to some sort of angle to unlock this sort of this sort of this camera to subject viewpoint um, in our pictures. And when we get down to this level, we can get that really strong connection with the eyes of the subject. If we take on head on angles, we get particularly we get the chance to create more of a face in our subject. This is a, um, a spiny head, a rough head Lenny. And this subject is obviously very very good for this a good head-on angle waiting for the eyes to spin around and look at the camera and photographing it in this formation of eyes above a nose above a mouth creates a face that anyone in the world can recognize as a face and it allows them to connect with this subject and start to have a relationship with the picture and therefore like our picture that much more and this is something we can do with a lot of subjects. Get down low and then give the subject time to be relaxed with you and wait for those eyes to come forward. I find one of the best ways to do this is to stay completely still and then make a small movement or sometimes you can tap your fingernail onto the, the port to make a little bit of a noise and that will often bring the eyes around. But it only works if you are completely still. And one of the mistakes everyone makes is I tell them this on the workshop and they go down and they're underwater like this and they go, I was waving my finger. It only works if you are really, really still. You wait till the fish has sort of accepted you as being stationary and then you make that small movement and you can attract their eyes. If you're moving a lot, it's not going to work. But when it does work, it allows a real connection with the viewers. I wouldn't want every single picture to be a fish looking straight down the barrel type shot. But I think amongst the portfolio, it's great to have these pictures. And particularly because it arranges those eyes another, but above the nose, above the mouth. It allows the viewer to project that character, that personality onto our subject. And it works right across the range of different subjects around the, around the world. And, and surprisingly, even with very uncharacteristic subjects, I mean, this 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 flatfish here, it's a flounder or a sole, um, you know, you know, taken in Iceland, actually, it was sitting on a, an old rubber tire, which is where the black background came from. But it was um, this angle, I think, has really unlocked the character in it. And I like that slightly open mouth. Again, little quirks like this, little gestures in the subject can really elevate a shot in when you take a series from a particular subject. So. Just a little bit of scuba diving basics. I already said being as still as possible is really important. And I think fish photography, one of the challenges of it is it's kind of a more pure wildlife type photography. And as a result, the right sort of approach to the subject is really, really important. Giving subjects time, watching subjects as you move in, minimizing your movements, your breathing. I'm not going to tell anyone, particularly on a live webinar, to hold your breath when taking pictures. But I think underwater photographers down the years have discovered that if they breathe so slowly that no air comes out, they do find it a lot easier to, to get in close to subjects. Good trim, good buoyancy, no flapping around. All these things make a difference. And actually, there are some underwater photographers who I know and dive with who are really, really excellent divers. Absolutely fantastic in the water. And there are plenty of others who are very, very successful in, with their images and with competitions and publishing and things like that, who are not very good divers. And I do think working on those diving skills really pays off with fish photography, particularly free swimming fish, not so much the stuff that lies on the seabed in, in Lembe. 
Another thing that I'm always looking for when I do fish photography is finding the right individual. It's not just a case of finding the species you want to photograph. It's about treating fish as individuals and finding that individual, that supermodel, that really is going to stand out and re be helpful to us as a, as a subject. And every now and again, you'll find a fish. Maybe it's 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 used to divers. Maybe it's learned that divers are an opportunity for food. That'll just be that much more friendly. And I don't really care what species it is. But when I find that subject, I'm going to make the most of shooting it. And that can allow you to get really close. There are parts of the world where particular species are, are, are friendly and you can get these, these strong images from them. This is a Nassau grouper in Little Cayman. And when you've got those friendly species, that's when you get those really special shots. So even if you went in the water with the plan of shooting exciting sharks or something like that, when I meet one of these friendly subjects, I'll often change my plan and really put the emphasis onto them. Because when you get those supermodel model subjects, that's when you've got your chance to take your best ever national group of photo or your best ever lionfish photo or whatever species it happens to be on that day. Other things that I think are important to think about is, is trying to give your picture a meaning. I think one of the things that can really do a, a photo with power that people really want to look at is if it's time to capture a really special moment and taking a picture that really captures the peak of the action can really do that. And, and obviously natural behaviours lend themselves to this automatically, um, whether that's a pair of fish spawning, in this case here, a, a yellow-headed jawfish spitting out its edge and catching that moment it spits out, spits them out, are very obvious. But also the, that, that, that timing, that peak of the action, can just be in the pose, the shape of a fish moving through a frame. It doesn't have to be natural behaviour. I mean, complicated natural behavior it can just be catching a moment in this case a yawn but it could just be a turn a, a fish spreading its fins erecting its fins and that sort of thing it's a classic piece of underwater photography advice that i'm banging on about all the time but getting those backgrounds right are really really important so if you are able to to Think about this as well when lining up a shot, so much the better. This is a very standard small damselfish. We call, often call them chalky dips because they look like a white damselfish that's been dipped in chocolate. It's not a fish that you would normally spend any time shooting, but I spotted a really strong background. It's actually just out of focus coral that I could use with this fish. And it, it allowed me to create a really interesting and unusual image. Generally though, we want simple backgrounds with portraits. We want the subject to be the star of the frame. So the background is there to play a supporting role. So simple solutions like black backgrounds can make colors stand out, can make complicated shapes stand out. Blue backgrounds, nice, clear, open water. They can make, make can help the subject stand out and give a nice naturalistic look. And if the subject such as this um, tiger cardinal fish on the right, doesn't give us those opportunities to frame it against open water, then we can maybe play around with using shallower depth of field to blur away that background and allow the fish to be the star of the picture. When it comes to capturing character in our subjects, the eyes are really, really important. And I showed a lot of pictures when talking about that that had two eye contact. And two eye contact is really great. It's the best way to, to get that character into the subject. However, if we don't get that character. Um, however, not every fish gives you that opportunity. A lot of fish, I would say the majority of fish, don't have eyes on the front of their head. They have eyes on the side of their head. And while we can still photograph them from the front, you tend to end up with two eyes sticking out the side. And you can, you can see the eyes, but they're not connecting with the viewer. And a huge number of fish are what I call one-eye fish. And that doesn't mean they have one eye, but it means that actually they're better photographed going for that one eye to really get that eye to connect with the viewer um, properly. And, and this group is a good example. I think frogfish are another good example. They sit still, very easy to shoot head on, but a lot of frogfish have their eyes quite on the sides of their head and you never quite get good eye contact with two eyes. So coming around the side, getting really good, strong single eye contact is often a better solution. So be honest with yourself about it as a photographer. Is this a one eye or a two eye subject? And it can really help things out. Right, I'm now going to attempt. Oh, wait a sec, just need to turn that one off. Um, I'm now going to attempt to answer any questions. This is going to be fun. Right. Um, right. Let me go through the post. I don't know which was the first one. Um, I can't resist what. Um, how do I get these to come up? Mm. Oh, no. I think I can only get them to come up live. I don't know why I can't get them. Let's see if I drag it across. Does it come across? 
Yay! Oh, well, that's just a thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I think this will go for. I think that's... Uh, thank you, Nick. Good to see you watching. Tony with the right sort of sentiment. Um, there's not many questions here, but oh, this is good. You've been copying Nick. I certainly have. I think actually, I mean, joking aside, um, one of the best things that you can do as a photographer is to immerse yourself in looking at the work of lots of photographers. I think you can get lots of um, great ideas all the time. From Phil. Everyone, the, the, um, yes, so very nice. Okay, plans for diving going on in the discussion. I hope this is helping to get them out there. I love the Red Sea as well, um, and I've been going not quite that long. Um, I wasn't diving in 87, um, but almost, almost diving. The next next year I did it. Um, Mike uh, Veach, good friend, new trip plan uh, announced today. Um, yes, I think that's not the best way to spend um, $1,000. I would borrow one from a friend for a trip, itch that, um, scratch that itch, and, and then give it back to them. Very good point. Um, I'm a addict of photographing in enemies and an enemy fish. And I think that Mike's point, you should never swim past a board an enemy. Definitely not. I struggled to swim past any an enemy fish. I think they're a fantastic subject and always, always, always. Can. And Phil agrees with that. Um, hello, Thierry. Um, How do you get those pesky seahorses to look at your lens? This is the, the photo I showed in the first part of the talk was a pygmy seahorse. Um, I think they're a real mistake to chase double eye contact with pygmy seahorses. It's not something you'll get with any reliability. Always focus on getting one eye good. If you happen to get a good cooperative one, so, so much the better. The different species of pygmies offer different amounts of double eye contact. I would say the Denise pygmy, the one I showed, is the most chance of getting double eye contact. Then um, the Bargibanti pygmy, um, George Bargibanti pygmy. And then finally, the sort of the more um, Pontos, type pygmies their eyes are really on the side of their head and they're much better always dealt with as, as a one-eye fish as, as, I, as I call them but I generally never chase it but the key thing is not to stress them if you can if you have the opportunity to spend time with pygmies without taking loads of shots and actually just sit there with them and wait for the opportunities rather than going it's a pygmy I have to shoot as many frames as possible you have much more chance of getting that eye contact and I know um, lots of friends saying hi hi Christian Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay with the thing. Um, do you take any bad pictures? How many do you throw away? Um, well, I can promise you, I throw away more than almost anyone else I know. Um, so it's a real key, you know. As I say at the beginning of almost every workshop, edit your work strongly. If you show people a hundred pictures and ten of them are excellent and the rest are very good, they'll think you're very good. If you show them ten pictures and they're all excellent, they'll think you're excellent. So delete is your friend. Well, there's loads of questions. Do you have any space available on workshops after COVID? Um, I'm sure, I'm sure that when the world opens up to, to travel again, there'll be trips where some people are able to come and some people aren't able to come. I don't feel it's the right time at the moment to be announcing stuff and talking about these spaces, but it's the travel agents who run my trips are well known and you're very welcome to email them and ask them about spaces and things like that. And I'm sure there'll be there'll be opportunities once the world does feel like we're able to travel safely and medical advice and government advice is saying that that's the case. I'll definitely be launching some of the trips that I've got planned for next year in amongst all the ones that have had to be rescheduled from this year. Oh, my goodness, there's loads of these comments. Ah, right. OK, I'm going to I'll go through them. Um, Thank you, Jan. Um, Chip, do you use panning techniques with damselfish shot? No, that damselfish shot was just a shallow depth of field shot. And those amazing patterns were actually um, parietes coral, one of the common boldy corals that you get on a lot of reefs, just in really in shallow water in morning light. And it was sort of lit in a very, the sun was low in the sky and it was lit in a really interesting way. And, and when it was out of focus, it just looked like those amazing waves. And it's a completely straight shot. I really love that shot, but no one else seems to. So I'm glad you like it. Um, how do you do this comments thing on the screen? I'm just clicking on them and they're coming up. I'm not sure. Um, those of you who enjoyed um, the video from the Red Sea last week know all about jumping. Um, what's a good bath stop? So it's a, it's a very good question without a simple answer, Pam. Um, if you want to blur the background of, a, of any photo, you need to use a, a wider aperture than normal. How wide depends on a few things. It depends on how close you are to the subject and how big the subject is in the frame. 
it relates to the length of lens you're using. The longer the lens, um, the less you need to open up the aperture, um, potentially. And it relates to the camera sensor size. So if you're a full frame shooter, you need to open up more in terms of numbers. The thing to remember is you just need to open up more. And generally, there's no right or wrong. It's about what looks right to you as a photographer. So I always take um, a number of shots and then give myself the chance to edit afterwards. How, uh, Massimo, how do you recognize a fish that's a good model for a portrait? For me, I, um, I guess you, you, you know when you know, and it's certainly fish that, I think the first thing I would say is I choose a subject based on how cooperative it's potentially looking. So if the subject is friendly and um, more so than normal, I'll always give it a lot of attention. And you'll, you'll realize that sometimes it can be because a fish is aggressive. Sometimes it can be because it's very territorial. Sometimes it can just be because it's super used to divers or sees the diver as an opportunity. Beyond that, I'm always keen to try and get as big a diversity of shots as possible. I don't want to always just go for, oh, it's the, the frogfish or it's the stonefish or, or whatever it is. I actually am really keen to, to try to get, you know, more normal reef fish. I love shooting butterfly fish, tangs, parrotfish. You know, parrotfish are one of the most common reef fish there are. But how many good photos of parrotfish do you see as photographers? Hardly any ever. Right. Um, Annalise, hi to you in Belize. Um, goodness me. Um... How are you going to deal with the COVID-19 situation? Well, I'm personally developing the vaccine and we're all going to be... F I hope we'll, we'll go on. It's not a great thing as a travelling photographer. Um, I quite like to escape the heat in England at the moment and get to nice cool water, the Red Sea. Um, but more seriously, um, I would love to be diving more in the UK. Unfortunately, I chose to live too far from the sea, which is really frustrating me at the moment. Um, most challenging subject... I would say photographing people because it's it's artistically very difficult to do interesting stuff. And they're they're also the people you've taken the photos of are the harshest critics of your work. The fish never come up to the review sessions on the liverboard and say, I'm not sure that's too good. Um, I'm sorry to give a slightly flippant answer to that one. Who's your barber? Why, well, it's the advantage of having no hair. Lockdown doesn't cause any issues for me on the hair front. Hi, Tim. What's the maximum option aperture for, for full frame super macro without going into diffraction? It's a tough one. It depends a little bit on the cameras. When I used to shoot my, my D4, I would happily shoot that to, which D4 is a 16 megapixel full frame camera. Didn't really have much diffraction issue. I would happily shoot that to F45. I now shoot D850s, which are much higher resolution cameras. I generally don't like going above about F29. But I don't think many of our audience really care about diffraction. If you need the depth of field, use it. Um, ultimately, it's going to limit your print size. But how often are you going to print that picture super size anyway? So I wouldn't get overly hung up on that. But those are my answers. Um, more workshop questions. I will have some new workshops in 2021, um, Gabrielle. Um, but there's also a fair amount of rescheduled stuff. None of us really know when rescheduling is going to stop and new opportunities are going to turn up. And when we know that, it'll be easier to answer that question. But I'm intending to have new workshops and bounced over workshops in 2021 without being away from home too much. But we'll see how that works out. Goodness me. I think the comments are coming in faster. So I'm going to stop with Jill's comments there. I heard it was dusty out there. Came in. Any of good advice on turtle shots? Um, first thing is when you see a turtle, turn your strobes down because turtles are generally more reflective than what you've been shooting, particularly if you're going to get in close. Um, the, 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 the scales on the underside of turtles are really reflective. So the first thing I do is I click my strobes down a click or two. I'm not, if I'm, if I don't get close enough to the turtle, it's probably not going to be a good shot anyway. And then spend time getting close to them. Um, don't freak them out by charging towards them. Just spend your time working your way close to them. Typically with turtles, if they see you swimming towards them, they're not going to like it. Whereas if you can sort of mosey your way into their area, once you're kind of up close to them, they tend to be very chilled out and will stay with you. So don't rush the photos. Invest the time in getting close to them and the photos will, will come very easily from that. I'll try and do some questions at the end, but I did have a whole other half of the talk to go and I've only got 20 minutes to have to go into nursery. So I'm going to get part two of my talk up, which is, I'll do it quite quickly and we'll get back to some questions because it's actually lots of fun doing the questions. I didn't realize. Right. So there's my talk. Now let's try and get me back up in the corner and keep going. And there we go. There we go. I'm back up in the corner. Right. So this hopefully is the second part of the talk. 
And the second, keep the questions coming in, by the way. I'll try and do as many as I can until my nursery imposed deadline at the end. The second part of the talk is a little bit of a shopping list that when I go on a fish photography dive, I try and keep most of this shopping list in my mind. These are just very, very basic ideas on the angles that really work with fish. And for me, when I'm with a, working with a subject and I've got a good cooperative subject, the ability to run through this list in my mind saying that will work, that won't work. I'll try this. I'll try that. I'll try the other. It gives me that, that flow of ideas that allows me to make the most of the opportunity. So I'm going to run down a whole list of ideas. I thought there was a slide with the whole list, but never mind. Um, and first of all, it's ID type shots. You know, we tend to poo-poo them a little bit as, um, as underwater, as photographers, that an ID shot can't be art. But when your subject is as beautiful as a queen angelfish, your viewer wants to see the beauty of the fish. So there's no harm in taking a very, very simple side-on black background, just celebrating the beauty of the subject type picture. We can fancy that up a little bit by adding a little bit of foreground and background if we want. But ultimately, these are shots that are celebrating the whole fish and its amazing patterns in our, sub in our subject matter. And it can be good for telling other stories here. This is showing the, the two flame antheus and the, the sexual dimorphism, the difference between the male at the bottom who's displaying to the female at the top. Ooh, a lot of talking. But I think certainly when you have a really special sub subject, the audience really wants to enjoy that subject and it's about recognizing that you know i don't want to go and shoot a subject like this and do all fancy cropping and and like blur the camera all over the place i want the viewer the viewer wants to see this amazing animal and enjoy it so actually as a photographer i can do a great deal by just taking that standard side-on type portrait all right next shots next types in environment i think this is this is kind of that classic wildlife photographers call it living landscapes or animals in their environment and i think showing animals and how they fit into their environment is first of all very beautiful but it's also very important it really shows that these these animals are part of a bigger system and they're nice pictures to turn take generally we often do these with slightly wider lenses because they allow us to tell this slightly bigger story this is obviously a stone fish in amongst stones um, a golden damselfish in a in an Anella sea fan, um, and and a pygmy seahorse, and certainly certainly something we talk about a lot on macro workshops is giving subjects space to breathe. And we have this often a challenge with, if we're in an area with pygmies where we say, who can take a shot of a pygmy where it's as small as possible in the frame, but still really works as a shot. There's no you don't need to necessarily fill the frame with the subject to make a picture work, as long as you make the rest of that scene, the rest of the frame work for you in the image and tell a story. Face on. So, um, sorry, face portrait. So there's lots of different shots in terms of portraiture of a fish that we can do around the face. Um, first of those is that kind of sort of um, somewhere between a quarter head on and three quarters side on um, kind of thing. So going for this very much one eye from the side type face. And this works on loads and loads of fish. So coming in from a side, but still having the subject coming onto the camera. The angle varies slightly with the subject. Sometimes it's very much just a quarter off off being straight on, sometimes it's kind of round to that three quarters off being straight on. Um, but it can really open up a subject and it suits lots of subjects, particularly fish with eyes on the side of their head. Wait for them to be coming to the camera, but turning. Parrotfish, um, butterfly fish, some of these common reef fish we don't tend to see. see, see. It can also generate quite a lot of nice character in the subject. We get good eye contact, but we still get that mouth, nose, and 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 an eyes combination of classic face that allows the viewer to see an individual not just to see a fish um a style of photography that used to be very common it's a little bit out of fashion these days but i think um is this face profile type shot it simplifies fish into this strong graphic shape massimo who i know is watching actually posted a picture just online just before i was um, came online to do this talk i saw of this style of shot and i think it it can look very graphic it's, it's a little bit simplistic but i think they can work well and it can suit a lot of subjects you get this nice profile you still get the eyes nose mouth um it works very well with fish with eyes on the side of their head and and you can play around with this idea with fish with different shaped bodies okay Head-on is certainly my favourite way of photographing fish. It can create a lot of impact. You've obviously got that, that energy of the subject coming towards the camera. It naturally gives you the eyes, nose, mouth layout of the subject. And you also have a lot of natural symmetry in the subject that comes from, from the, the natural symmetry of the animals. But that symmetry gives our pictures a graphic strength. Um, pectoral fins are really important in these types of shots. We saw that one in the first half. And 
I, if you've got a fish that's got nice pectoral fins, if they're staying still, fish often waft their pectoral fins backwards and forwards as a way of staying in position um, and staying lined up. And so waiting for those pectoral fins to come forward can really, um, can look very attractive and it can also help you fill the frame. If this fish had its, if this um, ribbon sweet lips had its pectoral fins clamped against the side of its body, it would actually would be very small in the frame. But with those fins out, it fills the frame. So I'm able to take this shot from slightly further away. Typically fish face into the current um, if there's current around. So this is a case where you often have to work yourself upstream of the subject and then come back down towards them. Obviously trying to be as smooth as you can in the water so as not to disturb things. But we can create really powerful portraits this way. This is a coney. Behaviour can really elevate our shots and I think it's something to be always on the lookout for when we're taking pictures of fish. There's lots of different types of behaviour to try and grab. This is obviously cleaning behaviour, um, simplified I think into more graphic picture. This isn't a picture that would necessarily work with the public who might not understand what's going on, but it's one that I think works well when you've as part of a series of pictures showing cleaning. Other types of behaviour, we have aggressive and territorial behaviour. Parrotfish very commonly do this mouthing off to each other, um, particularly at the end of the day you see it a lot, but you see it all the way through the day. Usually I guess two males just going, I like living here, no, I like living here more type of thing. And then spawning behaviours, which is one of my favourite things to photograph, mainly because they haven't been photographed a great deal down the years. And there's a huge amount of, of new types of pictures to take. And I really enjoy taking the, these types of pictures because I find them a technical challenge and a, a sort of knowledge of marine life challenge and therefore find them very rewarding to produce. This is a pair of, um, of um, yellowtail surgeon fish spawning in the Red Sea. Another type of behaviour that works very well in photos are schooling shots, and I'm not going to do a lot on schooling because well, in the Red Sea workshops we do days and days talking about shooting schools, but just to, to highlight briefly, there's two types of shots I like to go for with schools. One is having that whole school in the frame, having that complete entity within the picture helps communicate the feeling of togetherness of the fish, particularly if the fish are all the same size and all going in the same direction. It gives graphic strength to the image and makes the image powerful and makes people want to look at them. The alternative way to do that is to go fish right across the frame. So allow the fish school of this is so big that I can't get it completely in the picture. So I'm going to let them spill off all the sides of the, of the, of the frame and create this feeling of just endless fish, which also I think graphically the repeating bodies can work really well. These fish were swimming horizontally, but I rotated the camera when taking this picture to create this diagonal, which is, which is just one option. You don't have to do that, but it's, it gives that diagonal feeling of movement. Last couple, um, there's loads and loads of interesting details on fish. This is the, the expandable eyelid of a crocodile fish. You know, you, you can think of the starry patterns that puffer fish have in their eyes, um, that the little flecks that red Irish lords have in their eyes. Lots of interesting details to observe around fish. There can be details of the pattern and the coloration. This is a moray eel. Um, or, or other aspects of their biology. This is a part of a leafy sea dragon, but this has got a little um, isopod parasite on it. And you can see the parasite is kind of quite ornate like the like its host. Or, you know, obvious features. Eyes make for very good subjects. In this case, this is a, a wolf fish taken in Iceland with these great teeth. And I just sort of went in tight and, and had a go at really isolating these teeth and making them look really good. If it wasn't so cold, I would have tried some more fancy lighting, but I remember being freezing when taking this so um, I didn't do any more than that and then on, on a reef dive lots and lots of just patterns and colors to go for these are just on a these are all taken on, on Rassam Sid actually on one dive um, when when doing a review of the D7000 I think I remember and I just had it uh, on TTL the fish were super friendly and I just went down the reef and shot patterns it's a, a, um, a red sea raccoon butterfly fish an emperor angel fish and a mask butterfly fish and I was just sort of moving the camera around letting the fish be sideways on sometimes the fish can even be turning away from you slightly and you'll still get this shot to get you generally want these pictures to be all in frame and all in focus so um, you want to use a small aperture, relatively high strobe power, so that you can use that small aperture and try and get the fish as parallel to the camera as possible to try and keep the picture in focus all the way across. Often it'll drift away from focus at some point. Um, and as long as that's not too distracting to the viewer, I think you can get away with that. 
And then finally, just a few creative ideas to, to wind the talk up. Um, just ways of making our fish pitchers look, look different. This is taken with a, a snoot that I made out of the, the top of a plastic fizzy drinks bottle. We were on a liverboard, didn't have a snoot with me it was a long time ago in the Maldives. Um, they had plastic drinking bottles on, on, on the boat for our, our, our drinks. So I got one of these bottles, cut the lid off and just wrapped tape around it and taped it onto the front of my strobe and, and created a snoot, which I played around with for a dive and created some different images. Playing around with long exposures, um, this picture here is, is just a long exposure of an anthias doing its mating dance at night. This was very much trusting to luck, relatively long exposure, got the anthias in the frame and just took lots of pictures of it as it danced. And some were total junk and one or two created really interesting effects like this. Not really planned, I was just planning to see what would happen. Here using the zoom of a camera to create an interesting blurring effect. So another long exposure, this time zooming the lens. This is taken with a WACP1 um, lens. Zooming the lens during the exposure to create these textures and interesting things. This is with a bug eye lens. This is the old in on bug eye lens. This is a flounder um, or so, um, yeah, it's a, a flounder up in, in, in Iceland again. Using, using a bug eye lens to, to create interesting effect on this just to take my fish photography in a different way. This type of lens can actually be very good for emphasizing the comic character. And I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on the new Naughty Cam one in a place where there's lots and lots of subjects to play around with effects like this. And if there's a golden rule in fish photography, it's to try and get down to eye level and have those subjects coming onto the camera. But you can still take interesting and unusual lens photos by breaking those rules. And this picture here, I think, works, you know, because it's got that going away angle. Um, so, you know, all these rules, all these guidelines, all this advice that I've been trying to get out during this talk, they're just opinions. And I think one of the things I wanted to show with those anemone fish at the beginning of this talk was that if you, um, that actually the key to creating interesting images is to not try and do things the same way. It's to not follow rules. It's actually to always challenge yourself to try and do something different. And hopefully with that, you can elevate scaly, slimy fish into interesting characters, into beautiful images that people want to look at. So um, that's my last slide. Whoa, I don't want to do that. I nearly, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to me if I can. Um, why is that not working? There we go, that's me back again. And I'm gonna do a couple more questions and then I'm gonna finish because I've got 10 minutes or so. Right, um, okay, um, see if I can get these back on the screen. There we go. Greetings, greetings Oscar, for all the way from the Philippines. That's cool, I never thought about this. People being all around the world. Um, how do you avoid glassy fish eyes and get them black? Generally, I don't have a problem with that. There are some fish, particularly big eyes themselves, you know, which, um, which, which which really reflect the light like that. But maybe it's more of a problem with a compact camera with an inbuilt flash um, that gives you that red eye look and actually using strobes out a little bit from the camera like we typically do. But I generally don't see that as a big issue. I know a lot of good fish photographers, um, Paul Human famously, um, Roger Steen famously, did a lot of, did almost all their photography with single flash. And single flash is a very good technique for fish photography. It gives a little bit of a drop shadow off the subject and gives you that single um, catch light in the eye rather than two catch lights in the eye. So there's a lot to be said for, for, for single flash as well. Just slightly off, off angle coming in on the subject. Hi, Ellen. Thanks for the greetings. Um, for a nice bokeh, would you recommend to light the background or just use natural sunlight. I think that depends what you want um, in terms of the picture. And again, both ways can work well. Generally, I favor creating bokeh naturally in my pictures. I'm not a big fan personally of using artificial backgrounds. I, I think it's, I prefer to take a sort of a nature image rather than a created image. But I have used them and I teach them on workshops because I think it's their good skills to learn how to do as a photographer. So both can work well, but I think challenging yourself to do it with a natural background, I think creates a really, really interesting image. Um, it doesn't give the same sort of crazy effects, um, maybe not so good for competition photography as using artificial backgrounds, but I prefer that, that technique. What level of editing do you consider going into competition set um, submissions from, from Matthew in, in sunny Malta? It's sunny here in the UK, I'm pleased to say. Um, first of all, it's all about the rules. So read the rules, don't break the rules because you'll get caught and kicked out. And if you're not caught by the judges, you'll get caught by your peers afterwards. And that's even worse than being caught by the judges. So 
all different competitions have slightly different levels. Read their rules and stick to the rules. Try to understand not only the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the rules. Competitions set out their rules to try and get the type of picture they want. And if you try and bend those rules, you, you, you'll end up with not getting, you know, if you try and bend the rules or, or play everything to the maximum, you might not break a rule, but you'll be outside the spirit of the rules and the judges will say out. So it's very much up to the competition. I think I don't tend to do a lot of, under, I don't do any underwater photography competition entries really myself. I tend just to do the nature ones, um, which tend to be a little bit stricter. But um, one thing that is important when editing your pictures is to be honest about it. I have pictures that I show. I have a very well-known basking shark picture. That's a, a composite image. Um, and I'm always honest about that with my pictures. And I think that's all we can do as photographers is if we are going to use the editing software that's available to us, use it by all means, but be honest with people. Um, and I'm sure that you'd agree with that. Right. Um, how long does it decide to take the lead from Nicholas, um, Nicola? Um, how long does it decide how long does it take to decide to keep or delete a picture? Generally for me, pretty fast. Um, I ask myself two questions. Do I want that picture out there with my name on it? And if I don't want it out there with my name on it, it's pretty easy to delete it. I do think I edit my work a bit harshly sometimes, and particularly in this lockdown period when I've gone back into old folders, I'm like going, probably should have kept a few more. But actually, if you don't delete your work heavily, it's impossible to find anything. So deleting your work heavily can really help. And, you know, typically as an underwater photographer, you might shoot a load of shots of the same scene. The reality is you're only ever going to have time to process one of them, even if it's really good. So why keep 20? You know, just decide on the one. If there's only small differences between them, then so be it. Just keep one. So I delete pretty heavily. Do you have a subject that remains elusive? Yes, loads. Well, ran diving with you. Bloody... um. Um, wolfish in in on on the Pacific Northwest. We've seen them together, but I've never had a really cooperative one, and they're quite a common subject. I'm really owed one by them, so yeah, that's one that relates to us. But yeah, loads of stuff, and just about everything in the ocean that I haven't seen do anything interesting behaviorally is is another one high on my list. When focusing on a fish eye, what focus mode tactic do you prefer to get a good sharp eye? Right. So when with those very shallow depth of field photos. Focus is critical. With the eyes of a fish that tend to bulge out, the area that I like to focus on is that front, if that's the eye of the fish, that front line there, that's the bit that I feel needs to be sharp for the, the, the thing to be sharp. So as the eye, the pupil of the eye bulges out, there's often a kind of a lighter edge to it. That's the bit I focus on to make that look really sharp. In terms of focus mode, it depends a little bit. I love to use 3D tracking on my Nikon cameras, which is a continuous autofocus that turns on the whole sensor, but you tell it where to start and it picks the subject and tries to track it around the frame. And that's my typical autofocus for moving fish. For stationary fish, I tend to use a fixed point focus. And for those very shallow depth of field ones, it's the fine tuning is with rocking in and out and looking at those things. I still have good eyesight but it's not quite as close focusing as it used to be. And one day soon, I'll be telling everyone that super macro there's no art in it and I'm not interested in it when my eyes go. What's your favorite average depth to shoot? As shallow as possible. I want time underwater. I don't want depth and I don't want to be looking at my computer. I want to be looking at my camera and looking at the subjects. So shallow is great. Um, for really great blues, a little bit deeper than shallow is often good. I really love the light blues you get in, in the tropical waters, say it eight to 10 meters. And in, in wide angle terms, often a little bit deeper for the blues, but for the sunburst, that sort of depth. So yeah. Hi, Wade. <laughs> nice to hear from you. Yes, I, I remember you remember the fun we had on those amazing sheer water trips that were so um, yeah, really, really massive part of my learning in underwater photography. Okay, that's um, 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 Damien's one about focusing again I think it's it just rephrased it slightly but yeah it is difficult and the one thing I would say is if you're worried about focus with a particular subject shoot a number of frames and then before you start editing on which composition is better delete the ones that are not absolutely sharp you don't want to fall in love with a perfect picture that's not completely sharp it can be really annoying so get rid of them before you've had a chance to fall in love with them Yes, yes. Um, how long you need to wait is depends on the subject. Sometimes it can be short, sometimes it can be long. 
something I say in in my book, um, I, I, I promoted Carl's book, but not my book, but never mind. Um, something I say in my book is that if you feel that it's a pain to wait, fish photography probably isn't for you. If you just love being in the presence of fish, watching fish like that, that beautiful um, two bar and enemy red sea and enemy fish on your profile picture, Joe. Um, if you love being with fish and watching them, then it's never a wait. It's always part of the fun. So I always see it like that. And, you know, the photos come when they come. I'm after really special photos. So there's no point blasting away when I first arrive um, there. You know, it's for me, it's about waiting for that special moment. And I enjoy that wait because you get to see the subject. You get a chance to think. Any advice on setting white balance for rec photography? Um, it depends on the type of pictures, but I generally leave my white balance on auto unless I'm shooting custom white balance, preset white balance with filters on recs. So generally use white balance a lot um, on auto. Auto gives a camera a chance to give its best choice. And if you don't like that, you've got the processing software to fiddle around with it afterwards. Jill saying thanks. Paul, shooting cod and ling in low light, any tips on focusing? Um, I've not photographed ling a lot, but um, cod, which are one of their relatives, um, I've photographed quite a lot. I didn't find a great deal. I was shooting them mainly with wide angle. I think I generally don't like to use a focus light until I really need to. I think most subjects don't really like it, and I'd rather trust the really good autofocus capabilities of my cameras these days to get things in focus than to use a focus light. But if the camera's struggling, that focus light goes on. But it doesn't go, on tropical dives, it doesn't go on the housing, and on darker water dives, it goes on the housing, but it doesn't go on until I need it. Um, and I try and let the camera, things you can do to help focusing in low light is fancy focusing techniques like, like auto area and Nikon speak or 3d tracking definitely don't work as well as when you go to a single point one a single point puts all the camera's effort into that one point. And I think in those situations, it can really help the camera focus well by going to using those more simple modes, right? Favorite lens of portraits. If the water's clear, I shoot a great deal with my Nikon 105. I also, as a full frame photographer, use the Sigma 150 f2.8 macro lens a lot in clear water, say in the Red Sea. Um, in less clear water, I'll use, uh, use less long lenses so that I'm working closer to the subject. But 105 is, is my go-to um, as a fish portrait lens, but it does depend on the fish. Kirsty, any tip for time of day for certain behaviours? Um, it's... Um, it varies. Um, in the UK, it's probably more than time of day. It's probably time of year. That early springtime is a really important time to be in the water if you want to catch behaviours. A lot of marine life in our waters, Kirsty, where we're both, or you're diving and I'm hoping to dive at the moment, is it tends to kick into action in very early spring so that the eggs are hatched and ready for the spring bloom to be feeding in. Um, in the tropics, the, the, the fish tend to spawn all year round. And then the evening is a particularly good time for, for pair spawning above the reef or group spawning. The morning is better for egg laying um, because generally egg laying fish tend to lay eggs in the morning so they can guard them during the, during the day. Um, if they lay them in the evening, they can't guard them as, as overnight so well. So that I would say the morning is a general rule, but there are always fish that break those rules. In places with strong tides, it's often on the change of tide that that t determines the time more than time of day. So it depends a little bit on the conditions. All those factors tend to, to drive things. Thank you for the talk. Um, it is, yeah, yeah, nice, nice to hear from you, friends. It is really also nice and greetings to you across the ocean there. Um, I'd like to see one of one of one of those oceanics near to you one time. Um, ha, yeah, sorry, Mark. I, I just thought I'd try this. So thank you for tuning in. Um, spawning shots. Yes, um, I travel a great deal. The first thing I do as an underwater photographer is on my calendar on my laptop. I always overlay, overlay the moon cycle and it's a big factor in when I choose to run trips, if that's a really important thing to do. However, on a lot of my workshop trips, we don't tend to do a lot of fo focus on these types of spawning shots. And in fact, that red sea shot I showed spawning, I took that when everyone else on the boat was doing sunset splits. I took the boat to an area that was good for sunset splits. I didn't want to shoot sunset splits of exactly the same reef for the 25th time or however many times I've been there. So I, I went off and just dived under the boat, looked for common reef fish and tried to find some spawning. But definitely... Action tends to hot up towards moons, but it does vary. A lot of general reef fish are spawning at um, 
um, every day. So you can get these behaviors fairly regularly. Often a week before the moon, a lot of fish eggs that lay eggs take a week to, to, to mature and be ready to hatch. And they want them to hatch on the moon. So they'll often spawn a week before. But generally, I would say the most important thing is to keep your eyes open. And those like you who've dived a lot, dive well, go slowly, you'll see the behaviors. Hey, Becky. Hey, Paul. Right. Um, um, hey, thank you for all the messages. It's really nice. Ah, you, it's nice. There. Uh, you've heard the Red Sea talks a few times, but yeah, nice. Hope you enjoyed hearing the Red Sea again. I sometimes think this talks a bit like karaoke. I, I've done it so much. Everyone can kind of sing along with it. Um, right. Alejandro, you're very welcome. What's your favourite UK site for great seals? This is we're getting off fish photography a bit here. I've got, I'm going to wind this up in a sec because I've got to go to nursery um, to pick up Isa. Um, right, so favourite UK site for grey seals. The two standout sites for reliable encounters are Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel in in southwest England, and in northeast England the Farne Islands. Um, Lundy Island is really warm. You can dive in a wetsuit in the summer, but it's a little bit harder to organise. You nearly always need to stay over on the island and big charter boats you really need to fill a boat with friends to go there so that you can make the itinerary all about seal diving otherwise people want to go and do lots of other things the Farn islands is easier as a day trip it's obviously at the other end of the country um, the water is much colder there so it's very much a dry suit destination um, and the visibility is a little bit up and down there as well but i think the scenery is more attractive there i love the the big kelp forests and the colorful dead man's fingers that dominate below hand and there are a lot more seals in the farns both places I've had really great encounters. If I give them the choice, I'd rather do both. I'd also give a shout out for some of the Scottish offshore islands, which don't have friendly seals, but they have the chance to see seals in a much more, much more sort of wild setting, often with better visibility. And I've really enjoyed the photography I've done there. Right. Um, right. What do you think about continuous light for wide angle? Um, it's okay as long as your lights are strong. The problem with it is that you either need super strong lights, which are adjustable, which is quite a lot of work, or they don't tend to give enough light to balance with the with the ambient light. So it's perfectly possible. People take really nice pictures that way, but they're not as good as flash guns because flash guns we can control much more easily to balance with the ambient light than we can with continuous lighting because we can use the, the shutter speed to control the, the ambient light and without it affecting the strobe light. Whereas with continuous light, you adjust the shutter speed, it changes both. So you need to do everything by changing the power of the continuous lights. So it works, but it's not the best way to do it. Right, read your book, going across his, well, some, you're very welcome to come along, Kimberly. Um, I can't vouch for everyone being being as nice as, as, as each other, but we do have some good fun and there's some great characters that come along. Um, I'm joking there, of course. I miss going away with all my friends a lot. Nice to see you too, Brian. Hey, you stayed awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet you we drifted off for a bit there, Dave. Um, it will be great to see you, Parvin. Um, it's been a long time since we dived the Red Sea together. I've got to wind this up now. Um, hi, Marcos. I showed the, the picture from, from that was the category winner in Montfoto last year. Right. Um, I'm just going to the last couple. Right. I'm going to say goodbye now. It's time to go to nursery. Thank you for this. It was good fun. I'm really glad it worked. You all seem to. Have, I really enjoyed doing the comments, actually. Maybe I should just do a, a Q&A and not do a, a, a talk next time. But really, really enjoyable. Thank you, for everyone, for watching. And thank you for all the questions. They really, I think, made a really interesting discussion. Ciao.